Yeah, yeah. No, what is your role? What is your role? What is your role in the company? And what else are those things? Listen, you can do both. Yeah. 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 Okay, did everyone get a chance to finish that article? Yeah. Did anybody not finish the article? Okay. Um, we turned it in Thursday. Cool. Um, I'll just walk around and I'll just get the article from you. You want the last one? Yeah. Oh. Do you want to stay here for you? I don't know. Thank you. 
were you on the class last semester? For class over the other? No. No, I know you were. Yeah. You basically got to start. Al's great. Al's like my best, yeah. probably my best friend here. Uh, but he's, you know, he's entertaining. He does a lot of, you know, like stuff like that. But he's a, he's a really, really great guy. Professor Condon, you guys have known him? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to get into uh, school politics and all that stuff. What about the thinking? Are you guys familiar with being person? Yeah, yeah, I think Big Person. Yeah, I think Big Person. Yeah, I think Big Person. Yeah, I think Big Yeah, I think Big Yeah, I Yeah, I Yeah, I think Yeah, I Yeah, I Yeah, I Yeah, I So as a side note, you guys, so the class international management. You're like, all right, what's you know, like, what exactly does that mean? It's an international business where you're just studying how farms are created, how they operate, and then you grow management and which is leadership. And like I said, it's an experiential class. It's not a scientific. Um, it is a scientific class. The data is just not there. Because this is such a dynamic globalization is happening every day. So, the point of this class is to learn how to assess, evaluate, and make informed decisions about things that change very rapidly globally. 
like an international or work on multiple. But in essence, that is what the class is about. Uh, this class actually is, I think this is the first time I've ever had. This is the first international management class that I've ever had school. I think a lot of the professors not Because it's extra, you know? So it's kind of complex and conveying all the different parts that go into how do I be a global leader? How am I a global manager? How do I, you know, work in 278 countries in the world? How do I pick one? Things like that. So, so all of these things is to help you identify what are your strong suits, how can you adapt, broaden your mind, instead of being limited in how you think about things, or people. And since we have such a diverse group of people here, this is somewhat of an international vibe. So everyone should communicate and say, hey, that's a totally different approach. I don't do that one time because of this, 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 and that. But what's your approach to your culture? What's your approach to your culture? So we would all bring it together and say, okay, now I understand what I would need to adapt in order to do business with X, Y, Z. So that's the point of the class. Um, who wants to go first? Um, so we said that a role as a leader would be to provide the tools to motivate and inspire. Um, what are we using to provide the tools to not be a victim, to understand the different work style, and to um, know how to solve the problem and then start um, and then leaders have to take on different roles, so we can wear a different hat, whatever we need to get done, see what we do it. And then some challenges are the approach in which we manage. So if you want to be a friendly leader or if you want to be authoritative, then you want to have everyone respect you. And then just managing different personalities and learning how different people work. And then uh, what makes us different is that we are trying to be Okay, so everybody is adaptable. Okay. So we decided to rely on the role of management, and the user of management's role is to guide people and talk to the positions of other people and to learn what we need to do and what we need to do possible, and also to be by example. Um, what happens by the way, it does depend on the personality. It also depends on the number of people you're in charge of, how many people you're in charge of, how many people you're in charge of, and how many things you're in charge of, how many people you're in charge of, how many people you're in charge of, how many people you're in charge of. And also, how long you deal with pressure, because there will be each person who deals with quite a bit more. So, you know, it might be very complex if you're dealing with a lot of pressure, then you might not be able to do all that much to you. For challenges, you start able to do the personalities of your employee. They have to deal with all of the responsibilities and love and motivate their employees and communication because that communication is a little bit of a more of a challenge. Also, from uh, like different, like what differentiates us from others is experience, adaptability, willing to listen, and uh, trying to understand as well. Um, so, besides only the goals of the leader and manager, our agency operations and right now start by committing to your responsibilities, and your goals and tasks, and making sure that you're not doing things. Also, we have people that come to your team and try to manage their time to the right track, to make yourself in as well. Uh, just to inspire and influence those around you by being my example, putting my mother's name, who you can have about their school, who you can probably get into your structure. Um, we decided that the complexity of management was situational, so right now I'm trying to manage how much more students can be much different than a business. Mm -hmm. We may have a lot of too much characteristics, but it's not as formal mm -hmm. in some situations. Um, some of the challenges were exploitation, time constraints, and lack of resources. And then we decided that with different than others, because we're more knowledge open minded. 
feel like power and substance is something you want to come as a company in your situation, you want to make an impact, you want to feel like you're important, and you want to like, see other people. It all makes sense. I mean, the number one thing I see from each person that's like, right? That's on the number of employees, how many people in the company, the resources, etc. And that's what the real answer is. What makes it very different? And so when it comes to leadership in an international context, as contention. So the approach we take is a contingent. Kind of hard to say, but it really is a team capital. Uh, and that's why it's so very easy for companies to you know cut 14, 12, 10,000 people. Because people are just decision when we say labor and staff, <laughs> I think that's more of a downward management. So these people are just pretty much numbers. And that's really how they have to be viewed in that context. What were some of the other things we said were contentment? Things like motivation. How about we throw in what we learned last week, which is politics. Technology. Actually, there is a model. Um, we kind of described this. I just wanted to write it down. So we'll call this the SAC model. That's what we want. Thank you. 
So we start from the outside in. So if you're working as an international manager of operations in Europe, what is the first thing you need to value yourself? You say I won't start a business in Europe. Actually, how about a business environment? Do you mean like legal environment? Yeah, but I mean, how is it? Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, I think that. Well, you say there's so many good clients. You need to update my board record properly. So, okay. I think that would go more okay, so think of the contracts. You have three facets, which is the global, you have to look at that before you do look at the region. You look at the region, how much you do, how much you can work in. And then you will look at the local, which is actually your company and how you structure it. So from here, on the global scale, we're going to look at, let's just say, trends in Europe. Is this one not? Yeah, Okay. And here you think of regional, the country that you'd be working in, politics, right? Like you said, socioeconomic. Regional, then we get tech. What's the technology like in the country? How's the infrastructure for it? From here, you gotta know, just observe the country and say this country is going to. How restrictive is this? What are some of the things you'll look at in your operating environment as you're operating the company? What's the impact? Resources. Resources. What about the ethics? Culture. 
Alright, so the call trouble will last until the comes here too. I wouldn't say that the the world has a call. It's there. And CS power is all nice. Yeah, so that's just what I'm do, kind of what I wrote with this stuff. With CSI. Uh, corporate social responsibility, and yeah. which is huge and, and you know, like the brain ethics and stuff. Ethics is everything to do. So in looking at something at some of the environments that it exists around the world, we see that people are starting to create alliances. Countries are starting to create alliances. What would be the reason that countries would want to create alliances amongst each other? Mm -hmm. So it's experiencing sort of dominance so that it will reap the rewards. Or work with our other countries and we get more, only when we get one country to do something about the cost. Maybe I can cut it to the next year. About increase your GDP. When you open up your borders, open up your trade, now you're allowing for an entire you know, uh, international global market to buy things that you can recently. Can we identify any alliances that we see around the world today that exists? Does everyone know what math it is? Yeah. Anybody don't know what math is? 
Do we know the countries involved in that? It's in like uh, US, Canada, and Africa is huge, it doesn't matter, a lot of impact. I think particularly on, probably more so for like Mexico and Canada than the United States. Now we have General Motors, have a few facilities down there, Walmart has several distribution centers down there. So it's really increasing the economic environment in Mexico. Mexico is becoming more wealthy as time goes on. Canada is becoming very wealthy in all that has to do. I think Canada, Canada is the second largest country on earth. Now I have very wealthy people. Um, any other? Yeah. So that's why Guatemala, Belize, uh, Ecuador, Panama. What other alliances are that we aware of? The EU, the European Union. What does that mean? Huh? We were very much in your country. Of a lot of things for a lot of investors, our economy. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see what happened. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm not really sure. And we have heard of the So where the EU is around uh, 27, the EU is about 53. This one probably right now to speak is the most important one. Because it's all in season. It's 53 countries in Africa. As we saw, Facebook is trying to launch a satellite, which blew up. They're working with it on that. Elon Musk was in that company. Tesla? SpaceX. Elon Musk. Or even recent rockets have worked for NASA and so forth. This one is probably the most lucrative one right now, as we speak. The Chinese are building up infrastructure everywhere. There. And you can go to places like Nigeria, Kenya, and you will see a lot of foreigners. You'll be very surprised. Uh, because their governments are very lax. They're trying to raise their you know, economies. And now that everyone, the borders have opened up to things like the AU. A lot of people see a lot of opportunities to come there and start businesses. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made there. So Africa is not the same continent in our heads that we think it is, where it's just savannas and you know, wilderness and forest. Africa is changing.
Mm-hmm. Are you guys familiar with uh, the international business? The bird nations? Uh, I don't know what I have to do on the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, very good. It's pretty more or less than the time. So, let me do so. Look, what? You know, what makes these places so important to, to operate in this? And pick in one if you want to. For gasoline and for the markets, a lot of potential for investors. Why do you think they're a market? What's so unique? Cheap labor. Okay, fair enough. China get more expensive. I don't know how long that iPhone is going to be made. Okay, let's say cheap labor. In general sense, I mean, these are not, yeah, these are still very well developed. Where are we going? He said, uh, middle class? Well, I'm going to go middle class. Middle class. All right, how about I just come home now? Brazil. Is there anything to think about this? This is a lot of time that they all have had like a cold time, so they make it easier to import and export stuff. Yeah, that's important. Well, the average is that. What's the language they speak in Brazil? What do you do? What's that? What do you do? And what else? Now, language. Portuguese is the main language, but Spanish is the English language. We're talking. I mean, the fact that's the largest country in South America. If you look at this, you think, well, how many other countries around the world speak Spanish? And how do we utilize them? In Africa, for example, I mean, there's French probably has like one of five countries that French is the predominant language. Uh, there's a few countries that Spanish speaking is predominant. Um, but pretty much this is your gateway into Latin America. What about India? Anything you need to find? Which is what? Like what? Two billion? China. What's the population China? This girl's back in two what we talked about earlier. People just need to share things and have it. If you need to make 150 million iPhones in six months, you're not going to do it in Ecuador. You're not going to do it in Nigeria. You're maybe in China. It was predominantly in China because they're not going to be back. So. So the most important thing about China 
is the manufacturer. And here. Russia, on the other hand, is Russia is the largest country on earth. And also one of the most educated. A lot more before they broke up the USSR. So that's really just a snapshot of the main markets we'll be focusing on the EU, the AU, the BRIC countries. So actually, the book talks about China uh, specifically. It gives kind of a synopsis on how to do business in China. It gives you kind of like 10 key elements that would be important to do business with China. Uh, I could write some of those down, but I'm just thinking. So this is such a diverse group. What are some important factors? So we got some people who went out of country all the time, right? And you guys, um, student visa, mm -hmm. right? Who else went out as a country this summer? Spain, Morocco, Guatemala, Cambodia. I say very right London last semester. Where? London. Oh, London. And has anybody else lived in another country? Um, hmm? Alright, so let's just say important facts doing business. What you observed when you went to this country, and what do you think is some important factors in order to do business in this country? Who wants to start? Who place it in the um, so like when someone went to stay uh to stay abroad, and one of the things that we didn't know is that they, the people in the train um were um on um, strike, they don't have any sort of like like communication through like phone if they're terrible online and terrible people in person. And even then they like they didn't really know the phone to direct you know the most of the problem. We were guys in the train that can very supply that at home. But they want to try to do it in all our kind of things, and we need to work to try to do it and move on, but they didn't tell us Or the fact that we have to go in person and we have to sit out of the communication, try to figure out what's going on. And we tried calling, we tried to figure out that there was no sort of communication at the end of the day. It's sort of heavy, basically. Yeah, Any other like electronic media or something? So Spain, face to face. Can we talk about Spain? No, just tell me about what did you observe? What were some of your observations? Well, 
Anybody else on that? Can you play six then? Just some like one specifically now written, but uh, they're just really uh, concerned about quality over anything, so they're willing to pay a little more as long as it's real cool. Really, like, it's hard to move the air in there, it's like not GMO, real cool, high quality stuff. So they care about the giving of the facts. Yeah. And that seems not matter. Yes, but now we just care about the quality of the product. Is it because things are built locally or because well, they have a lot of like, local farms and they're it's a very like green uh, country in particular, but um, yeah, I think it's just the culture too, like they kind of just they you know, they want to have nice things. And then we have the battery of the broken town. Yeah, but now it's less than a dollar. Don't do that. It'll always be the town. I was going to add a thing. Yeah, but. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they're very into like family magnificences. Like, there's a lot of um, weight put into like right? this is what my family did to us. I'm gonna do type of people like me with the travel and things like that. It's how I'm doing it. Like, well, my grandpa did it, my dad did it, how are you doing it? Type of thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's Everything's in last name. Oh, okay. My um, uh, my dad uh, is my sister. I still got like crazy, great grandparents. But everything here is last name. Last name, even the town of our last name. People who live in the town all are named after the town. So you always find Corioni. Uh, there's a lot of people in Corioni and New York. The Godfather, the largest mafia, too. The largest post of us, but it's quite a long So, so they have to play. But criminal organization, we won't get into the levels of the day, but even they have breaks. Alright, so looking at all of these different variables from all of these different places, we have to try to formulate what it is we need to know in order to be successful and thrive. I was going to talk very briefly about <clears throat> kind of personal things. I think a little bit. Like, what is your motivation in your job? Is it to move up the corporate ladder? Is it just purely money? Is it something else? What is the most part of the money? Because we almost there. <laughs> Do you, for the people who work, do you feel like to make enough money? No? I don't know. 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 Respect for myself in my work. Like, like right now, I don't really, I'm a butcher, so I don't really like when I, I don't like talking to like, you, know, I feel very like, savage. So <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, you mean you're not a description? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's why I aspire to have a job where I don't feel it's very. I think the butcher is very interesting. <laughs> it has to start from somewhere, you know. And I think it was 
a really great profession a long time ago. Um, now there's just so many different things. Like people, people really look to technology, you know, if you work in uh, digital marketing or something, that's what people have to do. But old school things like a butcher, a bus driver, those things people kind of like look down on now because they're basically manual using using your hand and people think like, okay, oh, these are the biggest thing. But you know, even lawyers, lawyers are kind of like not a great book. Versus the non student law general that they have. Some of those guys I know will just like public defenders and make like $25,000 so let's say the amount of money we hope to make more but for some reason it's like that all the time what are some of the factors that make us not get I mean, you know, we won't have to discuss kind of the general precepts of how we feel personally. Let's just say, let's keep that in mind. This is what keeps us down. Which is directly related to. Cost of work. This can go up, but as inflation grows a little bit, the cost of living, we don't change. We just keep the same on our thing, the same on our own. We love the kitchen, the kitchen. We're two kitchens away from not having food. So the same thing should be looked at from a managerial point of view. How do you come back? These forces. You have a job if you don't make money. So what are some of the things we could throw in here to make us not increase our bottom line over time as a man? Or local boards? Think in a lot of things, think well. How do you like health management and reducing your costs? What do you need to overcome? What are some of the choices? Well, there's not a lot of people in the field of the world, and I can't see that I have to try and Here's what you do on the other hand. Let's say tariffs. So regulations. Uh, and natural resources. Probably one of the biggest things is changing technology. That one's huge because if you don't put in enough money for your technology to change over time, you essentially leave behind, especially if you are working like IT, 
for you dealing with heavy tech support uh, services. Uh, most of you going to go on there. If you're not going to get to do this stuff, uh, you are going to fail. I was going to get into uh, the other two forces of uh, cultural dimensions that we started on the first day of class, but I don't think we have enough time. I will show a short video. I'm going to take a talk, a short one from uh, leadership. And then I know that syllabus, we talk about global updates on syllabus. So that one, this come next class, this come with something that's going on in the world and share it with the class and we we'll can we'll discuss it with so we'll all have our own thing. And then what have you been here for like the last half an hour of the class? What is what for the first five minutes? Let's suppose they were all the people for the to the cause. Let's talk about that in the process. I want to introduce you to an amazing woman. Her name is Davinia. Davinia was born in Jamaica. Emigrated to the US in the age of 18 and now lives just outside of Washington, D.C. She's not a high powered political starter, nor a lobbyist. She'd probably tell you she's quite unremarkable, but she's having the most remarkable impact. What's incredible about the video is that she's willing to spend time every single week focused on people who are not her, people not in her neighborhood, her state, nor even in her country, people she'd likely never meet. Davinia's impact started a few years ago when she reached out to all of her friends on Facebook and asked them to donate their pennies so she could find a girl's education. She wasn't expecting a huge response, but 700,000 pennies later, she's now sent over 120 girls to school. When we spoke last week, she told me she's become a little infamous at the local bank every time she rocks up with a shopping cart full of pennies. Now, Davinia is not alone. Far from it. She's part of a growing movement, and there's a name for people like to be global citizens. A global citizen is someone who self identifies first and foremost not as a member of a state, a tribe, or a nation, but as a member of the human race, and someone who's prepared to, thank you, <laughs> and someone who's prepared to act on that belief to tackle our world's greatest challenges. Our work is focused on finding supporting and activating global citizens. They exist in every country and among every demographic. I want to make the case to you today that the world's future depends on global citizens. I'm convinced that if we have more global citizens active in our world, then every single one of the major challenges we face from poverty, climate change, gender inequality, these issues become solvable. They are ultimately global issues. And they can ultimately only be solved by global citizens demanding global solutions from their leaders. Now, some people's immediate reaction to this idea is that either it's a bit utopian or even threatening. 
So I'd like to share with you a little of my story today, how I ended up here, how it connects with the media, and hopefully with you. Growing up in Melbourne, Australia, I was one of those seriously irritating little kids that never ever stopped asking why. You might have been one yourself. I used to ask my mum the most annoying questions. I'd ask her questions like, Mum, why can't I dress up and play with puppets all day? Why do you want fries with that? What is a shrimp? And why do you have to keep throwing them on the barbie? And Mum, this haircut? Why? <laughs> the worst haircut. <laughs> As a white kid, I thought I could change the world, and it was impossible to convince me otherwise. And when I was 12 and in my first year of high school, I started raising money for communities in the development world. And we were a really enthusiastic group of kids, and we raised more money than any other school in Australia. And so I was awarded the chance to go to the Philippines to learn more. It was 1998. We were taken into a slum in the outskirts of Manila. It was there I became friends with Sunny Boy, who lived on what was literally a pile of steaming garbage. Smoky Mountain was what they called it, but don't let the romance of that name fool you, because it was nothing more than a rancid landfill that kids like Sunny Boy spent hours rummaging through every single day to find something, anything of value. That night with Sunny Boy, his family changed my life forever, because when it came time to go to sleep, we simply laid down on this concrete slab the size of half of my bedroom and myself, Sunny Boy.